no matter what diet you're on, regular exercise, particularly resistance training, is probably one of the most powerful levers you can pull with regard to you know longevity, functional longevity, resistance to disease, um, you know metabolic capacity. So you should be putting on and, and, and guarding your lean tissue like it's gold because it really is. And so that's something people have to understand. You don't have to be in the gym doing heavy deadlifts to to get stronger. There's many many ways to do that. And there's there's you know there's literally unlimited ways to do that you pick up things and go for a walk with us you put a backpack on and go for a walk all those things relative to where you are now i think as you get more proficient at stuff you should continue to challenge yourself because the whole point is just to progress and continue to progress and even at my sort of relatively advanced age i'm still making actually objective progress and getting better it's never too late to start there's studies on 90 year olds that are able to put on muscle at, at age 90 so anyone can do it it doesn't matter age sex you know health condition you can always improve with regard to that i love that This episode is brought to you by Myoscience Nutrition, tools to help you support your body's micronutrient levels. So today we're going to talk a lot about exercise. We're going to talk about why going in the sauna is helpful. We're going to talk about intermittent fasting. So all of those aforementioned lifestyle modalities that support health also involve losing healthy levels of electrolytes. So if you do any of those things, sweat in the sauna, exercise, you intermittent fast, you should consider supporting your body's electrolyte levels. So Myoscience has created, and I've been involved heavily in creating this new electrolyte that is honestly one of the best that's ever been built because it's built with ancient Redmond real salt that is sourced domestically here in the U.S. You have chelated magnesium, that is magnesium bisglycinate chelate. You have potassium, you have calcium, plus you also have taurine and creatine. So as I've mentioned to you many times before, this multi-ingredient combination formula has been studied by researchers to help support athletic performance and also the body's hydration response, but this is the very first time that it's been commercially available, and you are going to be, if you decide to take advantage of some of these opportunities that are available for you, you'll be amongst one of the first people to actually be able to take this. So you can hop on over to myoscience.com and use the coupon code PODCAST to save on this brand new formulation that's delivered in these easy-to-use stick packs. So you can bring them wherever you go, whether it's after the sauna, yoga, gym, on a road trip, you can bring it anywhere and you can support your body's healthy hydration response. So in today's show, we catch up with Sean Baker locally here in Seattle, Washington. Sean's an awesome guy. He's been on the podcast before. I really come to enjoy his social media content and his information, the videos that he shares because he's really authentic. Now, I just want to make it very clear. If you're a vegan or vegetarian and that is working for you, I really think you'll enjoy this conversation still. We can all agree that what we're trying to get people to do is eat more healthy, whole, real food. A lot of people that go on these different diets, they end up getting junk food. And that's what we've seen with the ketogenic diet, unfortunately, is, you know, when we first started talking about the ketogenic diet on this channel in 2016, we were talking about intermittent fasting as a way to get into ketosis exercise and also cutting out carbohydrates and increasing fat and protein in the, in the diet. Unfortunately, the ketogenic diet has been bastardized by food companies. So you see a lot of processed ketogenic junk food. And we've seen that happen again to the paleo diet. We've seen it happen to the vegan and vegetarian diets. So what Sean and I and many others have been talking about is, look, we can disagree around the, the edges and sort of the split hairs on different macronutrient levels. But what is important to take away from this conversation is eating more healthy, real food. And if you're sort of upset about the fact that we talk about consuming animal products, I think it's important to understand that many animals are inadvertently sacrificed, shall we say, to grow grains and plant-based products. You know how many snakes, rats, hawks, uh, and, and other animals, deer are killed uh, because they are going onto the agricultural fields where vegetables and crops are grown. We don't really hear about that. We hear about you know the sacrifice that cows have to undertake in order to make meat. But in order to grow your your avocado, in order to grow grapes, in order to have you know blueberries, animals unfortunately die. And so we don't often hear about that, but you can ask any farmer that is not doing biodynamic farm type farming measures. And as a hunter myself, you can get tags to go on private land and hunt animals because those farmers do not want their crops to be food for animals that are around there. So this is the unfortunate reality of the situation. I say this because 
there's this emotional reaction when we talk about meat that, oh my gosh, you're killing animals. But it turns out that if you're eating blueberries or avocados or grain, animals are dying as well because farmers don't like those animals eating their their income, right? That's how they make their money. So I just want to set the stage for that. So we're starting this on a clean slate. Hopefully you can enjoy this conversation for what it is. We talk a lot about exercise. We talk a lot about how resilience and having health is important. Uh, Sean, at age 55, he survived this the, the plague, if you will, quite well. He was sick for about two days, had to take a day off of working out with not taking any uh, interventions, if you know what I mean. So I think this is he's a great person to learn from. Let's cut to it with Sean Baker. Hey friends, welcome back. Today we are live with Sean Baker, the author of The Carnivore Diet, and we're going to talk about exercise, nutrition, lifestyle, and I think, you know, Sean, we're going to talk a lot about red meat, you know, uh, throughout this conversation, but just want to, you know, advise some of the people who eat, a, who are thriving on a plant-based diet. You know, we want people who, we're open-minded. If your nutrition plan works for you, I think that's that's great, but I would just say, Sean, to kind of kick off the, the conversation, um, I am frequently recommending a, a carnivore diet for individuals, especially that I coach who have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, psoriasis, rosacea, and they are getting amazing results. Um, and you were talking about some research that, that you're conducting through your through your company, Rivero Health, about, you know, hey, we're, we're you know, starting to study this to see who might benefit from from at least for going on a period of time, reducing some of those inputs to see what's, what's the insult. I'm sure a lot of people have heard your backstory, but uh, are you surprised by some of these findings now and in, in a large percentage of people who are sort of removing these foods, like what, what the outcomes are? Um, no, I'm not surprised because I've just because I've seen it so much. I mean, it's something I've seen from basically day one. And, and even before I started the diet, that's one of the reasons that compelled me to have an interest in this and, and, uh, and do it myself. Autoimmune disease is a tough thing, and it's becoming more and more frequent for whatever reason. You know, we, we didn't have as much people with autoimmune disease 50 years ago as we do now, and it continues to, to, continues to grow, and we don't seem to have a solution, a real solution. Now, there's pharmaceutical companies that have their solutions with uh, immune-modulating drugs, which do sometimes seem to help but most it, does, it doesn't help everyone it tends it tend, they tend to wear off uh, they have a number of side effects you know suppressing the immune system as you imagine we're more likely to get infections more likely to get cancers and so on and so forth plus the acute side effects so um this is something that uh i think has a tremendous potential to help you know, literally millions and millions of people in the united states the number of people suffering from things like crohn's ulcer colitis psoriasis uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's. I mean, you're, you're talking about tens of millions of people. So it's a, it's a significant part of the population. Mm -hmm. And then mental health as well, because we've seen <clears throat> sort of a un unintended harm of all of our so-called safety measures has been depression, suicidal ideation, uh, substance abuse and everything. Do you think part of that improvement in mental health is, is re removing those inflammatory inputs or is it is it the added nutrition, the iron, maybe you know carnitine, creatine, all those, or, or a combination of? Yeah, I mean, I think it's clearly a combination. I mean, you know, obviously, systemic inflammation affects the liver, it affects the heart, it affects the blood vessels, but it also affects the brain, and I think that has effects on its function. And part of the function of the brain is mood and cognition, and so those things go together. We also know that the brain has certain nutrient requirements, and those are hard to get with a standard American diet, definitely. And and I think a lot of those nutrients are well provided by by animal-based products yeah which is great so I, I definitely want to dive into some of these nuances and stuff but there's so much resistance when it comes to eating red meat you know and what i found is over the last couple of years i've invested more time in studying politics and controversial issues you know uh, gender dysphoria and and genderism and sport and all these different things and i, I find sort of sort of logical fallacies in these arguments and one of the arguments uh against eating meat is, well, meat's bad for the environment. Um, it's it's going to clog your arteries and all these things. And I think people sort of obfuscate or confuse the issues. Uh, and you've done a good job of helping people to understand, you know, if health improvement is your primary reason, um, you know, to, for going on a plant-based diet and your health is failing, why maybe you should consider going on a, on a, on a meat-based diet. How have you been able to sort of get through to people to help them realize that, hey, if their health is suffering by the way that they're eating, considering this an option without sort of rubbing them the wrong way or, or differentiating that from the environmental issues? Well, I don't know that I don't always rub people the wrong way. I mean, there's a lot of people that I do. But, you know, I think that, uh, you know, when it comes to, I mean, it, it's 
pretty obvious to most people when their health is not doing what they want to. And it may, it may take a year, it may take six months, it may take five or 10 years, but eventually you realize that what you're doing may not be working. And then the same thing for me, if what I was doing was not working, I would switch to something else. I'm not uh, dogmatically or married to any particular ideology. Um, I think when it comes to, you know, we can talk about, is it bad for the environment? Is it bad for health? I mean, I think there's some really glaring um, facts that, you know, sort of, you know, like the fact that we have less cows now than we did 50 years ago in the world. And people are trying to blame climate change on cows when it doesn't make sense. In the United States, 1977 or so, we had about 130 million cows. We're down to about 90 million now or 92 million. That doesn't make sense. And the same thing, red meat consumption has gone down significantly in the U.S. over the last 50 years, something like 30 or 40 percent. And yet all these diseases continue to become more prevalent. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, none of us are surprised by the fact that you know, our BC rate is now approaching 45%, and probably within the next 10 years will be 50%. And, and while this is going on, red meat consumption continues to fall. And so um, I think those just basic common sense facts should maybe cue some people that maybe we're, we're chasing the wrong, you know, chasing the wrong ghost, I suppose. One of the things that I hear from people often is, well, we can't feed the world on meat. If everyone were to start eating red meat, it's just unsustainable. Um, what, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, I don't think anyone's arguing that we need to put everyone on a carnivore diet. I've never said that. I think it's, it has its selected uses. I think, you know, I think meat is an essential part of the diet. I think every person on the planet could have some amount of meat, you know, and you can argue about what that number is. Uh, and I think you could have more than you have now, certainly. Uh, we know, uh, based on a lot of research within this space, that uh, we can certainly bring the efficiency. The problem is, if we look at the United States, you know, there's some criticisms about how we produce food. Um, some of it found, it's, some of it warranted, some of it unwarranted. Uh, but if we look at, say, the United States w- with our 90 million head of cattle, we produce more beef than anywhere in the world. You compare that to Brazil, who has the largest herd in the world, 250 million head of cattle. They produce less than we do. India which has almost as much as Brazil, 220 million head of cattle, their output for production of even dairy, which they they utilize a cow for, is abysmally low, like something like 20 times less efficient for producing dairy. So all we have to do is upgrade, you know, genetics, breeding, uh, animal nutrition, healthcare of the animals, and we would dramatically improve the efficiency and the availability of meat. Now, if we go into vertical integrated uh, a pasturing process where you have multiple animals running in the same field, you know, where you have cows and sheep and chickens and pigs all, you know, using the same acreage, you could dramatically out increase the, the output in the United States and throughout the world. So we could, we could easily probably double or triple our output without and probably improve our environmental uh, footprint on that. So I think that argument that we can't feed the world meat is, is, is not really based in reality. Mm-hmm. What's getting in the way of doing something like that and, and the sustainable agriculture movement? It seems like, you know, if you follow certain accounts online, you know, Rob Wolf and Diane, I can't remember her last name. Rogers, uh, yeah. Rogers right. Uh, it seems that there's, there is this underground movement, so to speak, of trying to encourage that sort of dynamic system where it's all self-sustainable and everything along that line. But uh, on like a, you know, these companies, JBS and Tyson and Smithfield and, and these other companies, are they... Um, getting in the way of that happening or what's, what's going on in terms of like an, on a macro level? Well, I mean, I think to a degree there's, there's an issue with the commodity beef market. And I can, again, I'll speak to beef cause I have a lot more knowledge about that than, than sort of pork and, and, and the chicken market. But, um, you know, we have four, like you mentioned, there's four, four major meat packers in the United States that control about 85 of the beef supply. You mentioned Cargill and it's Tyson, it's JBS and, uh, National Beef, which is owned by a company called Marfrig. Both of those are JBS and Marfrig are, are based out of Brazil. And, you know, they basically suppress the, the cattle prices to the ranchers. So the ranchers are barely making a living and then they hike up the prices at the retail end. So they're making these huge profits. So there is that model that they want to sustain. It makes sense for them. Some of those companies, I think Cargill and maybe Tyson, but I can't remember which one, are actually starting to look into regenerative agriculture, at least as a way of, you know, checking the box for sustainability because all the companies now are wanting to check their sustainability box. And so that's something that they'll be doing. They're looking at uh, feed additives. I think JBS, which is the largest beef company in the world, is looking at 
um, these sort of algae supplements for cattle so you can completely, almost completely suppress their methane emissions, which I think is probably unnecessary, but if it checks the box for those people, it does. Um, you know, and then you have the issue with the, the you know, the packers controlling the, the, the flow of the market. They control the processing facilities. And if you can't get your cow to be processed and, you know, you've got to continue to kill it, to feed the, feed the cow and you may not be able to afford to do that. So there has to be, um, a ability to do it at a more of a local level. And so we, we, you should have a processor in every, you know, in every County or something along those lines. And that would, that would do that. That's, uh, unfortunately the USDA, um, sits over that and, and, and to, to, to sell meat sort of across state lines and, and certain ways you can sell it. You have to have a USDA approved facility, which is very expensive. And so most ranchers can't afford to set those things up. And so there are some proposals in the legislature that are kind of hoping to do that. I think it, it may be still a little bit of lift service or they're talking about building 15 medium scale processing facility, which is not going to make as big of a difference if they had say a thousand smaller processors, which would make a bigger difference. But I think, you know, from a perspective, what you and I can do, just directly contract, contract directly with the rancher. You know, I've got a half a half a beef coming here in, in a couple of weeks from a rancher, you know, locally here. And so that's something that helps. And the other thing is, you know, as you see the prices rise, you know, we were going through this, you know, historic inflation right now. Beef prices are up 20%, you know, egg prices are up 15%, so on and so forth. I know you got backyard chickens, so that's, you know, you don't care about that. But, I mean, I think the direct-to-consumer prices has pretty much been the same or mostly the same. There are some issues around fuel costs. You know, fuel costs are going up, so that's going to impact to some, to some degree. But you're still relatively ins- insulated from that inflationary cost that you're paying at the supermarket right now. Yeah, what's unfortunate is has gone through the roof. I mean, it's insane. Um, I don't buy chicken, but, yeah, the beef has, has really gone up, and that's in, that's probably impacting people's – Purchasing decisions, unfortunately, which is which is wild. Um, but going back, I want to get into the politics of this a little bit and and talk about the USDA uh, approved facilities or whatever. But you mentioned the algae. Is that sometimes when these sustainable things are initiated, they're even more unsustainable than the initial. Like when we intervene in a system, that's it's really complex. So, is growing that algae is that creating a secondary problem, or is that actually? Well, I mean, I mean, ultimately, we don't know. I mean, this is always the, the sort of the law of unintended consequences. And so, you know, the initial, I think this was a discovery made in Australia. I remember reading about this three or four years ago. There was a species of red algae when fed to cows, literally wiped out almost all their methane, uh, you know, that they produce from their rumen. And, and what happens is cows consume grass, forage, whatever, and there's bacteria in their rumen that convert that to methane. And so uh, you can impact that methane production by feeding them algae and shut that down essentially um, the problem is can you grow enough algae to feed all the cows in the world I mean, there's a lot of cows there's you know 1.1 billion cows or something so that's a lot of algae produced is there an environmental cost to producing that is that more so than than, than methane mitigation i don't know the answer to that um, are the cows going to get sick from that you know and, and will it affect the meat quality Probably not. I mean, I think they're looking at it pretty intensely. It only, re- you don't have to feed them much. It's only like less than one percent of their feed, you know. So it's a tiny amount, but uh, it, it could be a, a big answer for solving the methane problem. Although I think it's a, probably a problem that doesn't need solving. Quite honestly, if you really look at the methane, uh, you know, methane uh, science, you know, between flow gases and stock gases, and you know, so. But again, I think people are just checking boxes. Right, right, because they've been told repeatedly, so they believe it. You know. Um, that is super interesting. I wonder if that would change the omega-3 fat composition in the cattle at all, given them the algae, or maybe it's such a small amount that it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I suspect it's too small of an amount to have a significant impact. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people get hung up on that um, when it comes to grass-fed versus, you know, sort of the feedlot beef and things like that. Uh, the, you know, the composition of the meat, and I know one of your arguments is like, look, let's just make this uh, sustainable or well, more achievable for most people, which I think is a good idea because most people are buying the cheapest junk, Ruffles potato chips, Wonder Bread and all that. So um, where, what's your stance on that at this point in time in terms of the quality differentiating between grass-fed, pasture-raised and, and you know, conventional feedlot? You know, I think if I were, you know, I, I think there's a number of different arguments you can make. One is, what, what is the impact on my health or human health in general? And, and I don't think we have good data that shows that one is vastly superior than the other. I mean, I think, uh, 
Uh, there's very little literature on that. There's a couple studies out of Texas and AM. There's one out of Australia. The differences were unequivocal. You know, they were basically equivocal. And uh, but when we talk about the environmental impact, I think you can make a better argument. So I, I do think ultimately we should, as much as possible, push for sustainable, well pastured animals uh, where it can be done. Now it's not practical to do it in all places. You know, in the middle of, you know, in, we're in Washington State in the middle of winter time. When it's covered in snow and you're in the mountains, you got to feed your animals hay, you know, and there's, there's some of that going on. And so some places it's, it's more easily to do, you know, if you're in the Shenandoah Valley, like, uh, you know, the Polyface Farm, Jill Salatin guys, they, they have a they have an advantage out there. Um, but I think at the end of the day, meat is a, is a health food. It is a superior food to most of the food in the, in the, in the supermarket. You know, probably 90% of the stuff in there is just basically junk. And you know, you know, you you always hear the shop, the edges of the the aisle, whether it's produce and you know dairy and meat. You're, you're probably that's still probably very good advice for you know 99 percent of the people out there. Yeah, no, I I agree with that, and yeah, I've been surprised too. Um, I mean, my bias is buy close to your your home. You know, like you said, support a local rancher, things like that. Um, but you know, when you look to me, like you look at the literature, you're not seeing these massive differences in fatty acid profiles or concentration of zinc or quarantine or whatever. But to me, I just see a little bit, it's more qualitative. It's more subjective. It's like, well, it looks a little bit darker red or it just tastes different. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, smell as bad or whatever. There's different things like that. So anyway, buy local uh, when you can. And I think that's uh, a good idea and people can save money too. You buy in, in volume if you have the space to it, to do that, which is great. Um, so the politics and the regulations around food. And I know this has been something that I have really come to appreciate you talking a lot about freedom. You know, we've seen a lot of liberties being stripped away in under the guise or the auspice of, of promoting safety, right? And what I think people who don't study history have, uh, they don't realize that food restriction has been used as a way to sort of control humans and control populations. If you look at Cuba, you look at North Korea, you look at other sort of totalitarian regimes, food has been restricted. And, and, Part of me sort of feels that maybe um, there could be legislation in the, in the name of global warming protection or safety that where food could be sort of restricted and this is why we need to sort of continue to speak up and talk about these different things. Um, so have, how, how does that sort of sit with you now and what can people do uh, outside of the fact of supporting local you know, and buying local from the ranchers? Um, and what are your thoughts on, on this movement to sort of restrict potentially consumption of meat or access to meat well i mean obviously i'm opposed to that i think it's a it's an extremely bad idea i think you'll end up with a further debilitated uh, depressed and, and obese society if we continue to do that um i think that you know what we'll see for probably the next several years is a continued propaganda campaign a media campaign to, to get people to voluntarily give up meat and or reduce it significantly and and, and that is where they're going to start if that doesn't work and by all metrics that I'm seeing, it's not working because meat can, meat sales are up. I mean, they're 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 up across the world, or up up in the United States. The fake meat products, the plant based products, are down year over year from last year to this year. So people aren't buying it. And so, what is the next thing that happens? Well, they start making it more expensive and more challenging for you to do that. Um, ultimately, you know, we may get in a situation where you know, if we have this social credit thing going on, where you go to the store and they say, you know, you've reached your red meat consumption allotment for the week and you can't buy anymore um if that happens that'll that will make some people very angry i hope it never gets to that but uh i think that's why it's important to um look critically at our food and and, and do better nutrition research for one we have just really bad nutrition science you know particularly when it comes to these epidemiologic studies which are not helpful they're in fact they're probably making things worse uh, and then, you know, I think it's up to the individual to support those ranchers that do this. Because a lot of the ranchers are just thrown in the towel. They're getting bought out by big corporations. They can't afford their land. They can't afford to be in business. It's, you know, they're, they're doing it because they love what they do. And a lot of, a lot of them, it's multi-generational. Their grandparents did that or their great-grandparents did it. And they want to hang on. But slowly, by, slowly, year by year, we're losing them. You know, we had 100 and we had, I think, 1.3 million ranches about 50 years ago. We're down to about 700,000 of them in the United States now. And so it's it's continuing to happen. So we have to, if it's important to you as a consumer, you have to find a way to help these guys be successful. And the best way to do it is like what Mike was mentioning, just 
call them up locally. They're nice people, you know, so nice. <laughs> and they're happy to, they're really happy to, to provide you the best product they can. And, you know, you, again, you cut out the middleman and in often cases you can save money. You, you know, you might need a place to store it. That's the thing. You need a chest freezer. So buy a chest freezer. Right. Which, you know, they've been on, so there's all these supply chain bottlenecks and stuff, but on Craigslist or offer up or Facebook marketplace, um, you can buy used freezers, which I think is, which is great. Um, yeah. It's sad when you start to study or read into the regulations because these smaller ranchers sometimes get uh, regulated by, you know, the USDA, they'll do random inspections and say, oh, you know, you're breaking this or that rule, splitting hairs. I mean, there's all these different stories about people going direct and they kind of accuse them or insinuate that they're doing interstate commerce or against the law, you know, they, and so I, I can see why one of my aspirations is to eventually get into this space, you know, and have people come to her and do all that. But it's like, the more I read into it and some of these stories, it's like, it's like, yeah, it seems like it, you could open yourself up to a regulatory nightmare, which is sad. So you can see how these multi-generational you know, families that have been doing this for a while might be getting out of it for something easier, which is, which is scary because, you know, in 20, 30 years, what's going to be left, which is frightening. Yeah, who's going to feed us? <laughs> well, and what are they going to feed us? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's insane. So the social credit system, you know, two years ago, I would have said there's absolutely zero chance that the U.S. would ever implement something like this. Now I'm like, I'm not putting anything past my, you know, what I've seen change. How far along in China is this? And, and you know, is there any substance to this? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty well established there. I mean, I don't know. I don't know all the details, but I know there's, you know, significant uh, uh, restrictions and, and, you know, freedoms that are, you know, if you if you don't reach a certain social credit score, you're, your, your travel is restricted. Your ability to access certain facilities is restricted. Kind of like a, you know, kind of like a COVID passport right now. You know, it's the same thing. If you don't, you might not be able to go to, you know, uh, interstate travel or things like that. So that's occurring already. Wow. So you and I being together, we would have been gotten docked like 50 points or something. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> like, yeah. eh, you cannot even like get gas, man. You guys need Perhaps, that. yeah. Um, which is scary. It's like Black Mirror, you know, ha happening all over. I have a lot, I don't have a lot of faith in the government to officially pull something like that off. I was talking with my accountant the other day and he said, you know, the, the IRS has like something like 100 million pieces of mail that they haven't opened. It's going to take them five years to get through with that. So to see the government actually pull off an integrated system like that will probably take them so long, thankfully, uh, because of the inefficiencies that I think will be okay. But, um, anyway, I'm not putting anything past, uh, past it's it's insane what has happened in across the world uh, over the past few years but getting back to health um and then i want to get into exercise but talk about your particular run-in with uh with the plague you sir we sean and i are both survivors of the plague okay <laughs> sean just turned 55 was it sunday monday Saturday? monday monday, monday. Yeah. happy birthday thank you way. thank you it's awesome and um and so sean uh, you know when you're in november so just a few months ago you had three or four bad days right and I, I bring this up and weave this into the conversation because we know that cardiometabolic disease, risk factors, hypertension, coronary artery disease, these outside of age and obesity are among the top conditions that lend oneself if you're unboosted and unvaccinated to be to potentially to get severely ill. But of course, you've been eating you know, this way since 2015, 2016? Uh, 2016, yeah. 2016, ribeyes, you've been lifting weights, you know, you haven't been doing your yoga, Sean, <laughs> right? And here you do, you you have a few bad days, and I don't even think you had upper respiratory symptoms, did you? Not really. I mean, I I, I don't even think I coughed. I mean, I just kind of had uh, fatigue, a little bit of a headache. I did I did notice a change in my uh, taste and smell for, for about a week there, and my appetite was down, but... I, I miss one workout. I mean, yeah. you know, I took one day off and, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, to be honest for about a week, I didn't feel great, you know, yeah. but I was still plugging along fine. I mean, I could have worked if I had to, you know, go to work or something like that. But, uh, yeah, it was about a week of, of, you know, not being at, at top form, I guess. Mm -hmm. And at your age, I mean, if you look at the statistics, people over the age of 50 are much more likely to be hospitalized or severely ill and, and so forth. So, that to me speaks volumes. I mean, we can talk theoretically about these epidemiological studies and people that eat meat and heart disease and this, but you're like, well, uh, you look at Joe Rogan, you look at other people who, who are in sort of this space. Most of the people that I know that are eating a paleo carnivore keto style diet had essentially very similar symptoms. A little bit of fatigue, muscle aches. Yeah, it didn't feel optimal for about a week. Um, and to me, that is 
you know, these are anecdotal, right? This is unpublished. Uh, but comparing it to some of the stories that I've seen that the media has put out of the morbidly obese individuals who are eating McDonald's and things like that, who are on a ventilator, um, this speaks volumes, you know? And so you have done multiple, to the best of my knowledge, uh, coronary artery calcium scores. Have you done a few of those? Just well, I've done one. I did okay. a baseline one. Of, well, I mean, after I'd been on the, on the diet for a couple of years and it was zero. And so I, you know, I mean, I haven't repeated that yet. I might in another year or two because you don't want to, you can't do it that frequently. So yeah. I might do something else. Maybe I'll do a, uh, a little bit more uh, extensive one next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like an angiogram thing? Or uh, <clears throat> there's a, there's a company called clearly that has a, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's basically an AI driven uh, uh, dye contrast study that you can do. that looks at not only calcium plaque, plaque, but also soft plaque. Oh, right, right. And it can tell you if the plaque is progressing or not, or something like that. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, you'd have to have a frame of reference to tell if it's progressing or not, but it can tell you, it can tell you with a little more detail exactly what's going on and include soft plaque. So that's something, one of the criticisms of a zero coronary artery calcium scan is that you could potentially have soft plaque. Although the data clearly shows that if you have zero, the odds of you having much soft plaque are extremely low. Mm -hmm. At what point for a healthy person would you recommend, you know, a calcium score every at, at, 50, oh, at 50, 40? Like. Well, I mean, the literature suggests 40, and some, some suggest 45, and I think the frequency is like three to five years, something mm -hmm. along that line. Just to see. But, I mean, in your situation, you're like, well, what would you really change? You're, you're exercising a lot. You know, um, you're outside. You're walking. Get right? I mean, it's like... You, you can always do something more, but then there's... The, the, the question becomes how much time do you have to yeah. do all that stuff in? And so, um, I, I, you know, I, I sometimes I'll do... You know, I'll do spend more time, you know, like doing outside stuff. Sometimes I'll do more some of the red light stuff. I mean, I think those things all impact you. I mean, to me, the baseline is sleep, exercise, and what you eat. I think that's probably the major things I focus on. As long as those things are um, pretty well dialed in, I mean, the other stuff is kind of this, you know, 5% stuff, which is going to vary depending on what your motivation and time is like. Yeah, no, that's a great way to look at it. So going back to your recovery um, from, from COVID and everything, I think your exercise capacity, I'm just hypothesizing, right? I don't live with you. I don't know you. But I would imagine that your exercise capacity and your lifelong dedication to being physically active, uh, in addition to having good blood sugar health from eating a, a you know, lowish zero-carb diet, was a big part of it. Um, and I, what I've seen is people who are not physically active, who don't resistance train, who don't walk, um, they tend to get hammered by a virus that affects their lungs, right? Who would have thought, right? So um, let's talk about exercise. And how do we get people who are intimidated by lifting weights or think they're going to get super bulky or don't see the value? How do we get them lifting weights? Well, I think that the concern about it being super bulky, I mean, that's very, very hard to do. I've been trying to get super bulky my whole life. And I've never, never been successful at it. So, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that the first thing is to understand how critically important that is. I think I'm a proponent of a meat-based diet, and you know I've said many times I think there's many ways to, to be successful with, with diet, but no matter what diet you're on, um, regular exercise, particularly resistance training, is probably one of the most powerful levers you can pull with regard to you know longevity, functional longevity, uh, resist, resistance to disease, um, you know metabolic capacity. So you should be putting on and, and, and guarding your lean. Uh, lean tissue like it's gold because it really is and so that's something people have to understand you don't have to be in the gym doing heavy deadlifts to to get stronger there's many many ways to do that and there's there's you know there's literally unlimited ways to do that you can do you, you know you can you know you can pick up things and go for a walk with us you put a backpack on and go for a walk all those things relative to where you are now i think as you get more proficient at stuff, you should continue to challenge yourself because the whole point is just to progress and continue to progress. And even at my sort of relatively advanced age, I'm still making actually objective progress and getting better um, at things. So I think that's something that, you know, you should never, uh, it's never too late to start. There's studies on 90 year olds that are able to put on muscle at, yeah. at age 90. So anyone can do it and it doesn't matter age, sex, you know, health condition, you can always improve with regard to that. I love that. Uh, and you hit on something that I think is is sort of overlooked when it comes to exercise is that iterative progress and having like, you know, you get a little dopamine hit, right? When you have a PR and I want to talk about your PR that you did on your birthday, because I think it's, it's amazing and really inspirational. But when people go and just go, maybe they just go do the elliptical at the gym or they do the treadmill. There's really no objective 
way, you know, because they're not using power as a proxy to estimate that power output. So you don't really get better at it. You're like, well, it's very subjective. Well, I think I, I was less winded today or when I was texting during my workout, it felt the same, you know, and that doesn't lead to sort of a sustainable habit. That's just my hypothesis. But this is why I think with weightlifting, you know, like for, you know, you, you can deadlift, 415 pounds or whatever and you know at 10 reps that feels hard right but if if you did if you could only do two reps on on a certain day you might be like okay something is wrong with my nutrition my sleep my recovery i need to change something and that's why i'm again i'm very biased in favor of resistance training but it gives you that objective feedback yeah i mean you i mean you know a lot of us you can use it in the, in the the concept of gamifying something you know we, we get a high score on a video game we get a little hit of hit of that but you can do that with exercise and you know, when you're dealing with objective numbers, you know, the iron never changes. It's not subjective. It's always very objective. And so you can either lift something or you can't. And so there's, you know, there's certain things. It doesn't, you know, you, you, you know, like I said, I can go on a rowing machine and, and row 500 meters as fast as I can. It's never going to change. It's, it's only what, what output I can put out there. And so I think that uh, having tangible goals, and, and there's so many ways to do this. It can be how much weight did I lift? How long did it take me to lift it? How many repetitions could I do? You know, and, and there's, all kinds of ways you can you can make new new goals to, for yourself to make it fun yeah which i think is awesome so speaking about having fun so on saturday you were with uh, one of our past podcast guests a mutual friend stan efforting and stan is 54 you just turned 55 and so you guys had a little fun uh you want to talk about what you guys did yeah so uh and and stan was very gracious about this because uh this is my this is the one area where i tend to excel uh, and Stan was one of the world's strongest bodybuilders of all time. He's a, just a hugely strong guy. And uh, he knew I was coming up to Super Training Gym. That's Mark Bell's gym down in Sacramento. And said, well, let's do the deadlifts because you've been working on that. And so we had a little, a little. I mean, my goal was to do it for 20 times. So we put 415 pounds in the bar. So we, we went up. We went up to 500 pounds in debt for one just to kind of, it was called, you know, post-activation potentiation sort of. And then we dropped down to 415 and, and went for reps. And so I went first and my goal was to hit 20. That was a number I had in my mind and because it was a really sort of, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of monsters screaming at you, some of the, some of the top world-class guys in, in the world. And I was able to get 22, which interestingly was, it was an actual personal record for me for that particular lift. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been doing this for about five years, so I was happy to hit that at, you know, at age 55. And then Stan went after me, and he was able to get to 25. So, so next year we'll have to try to get 30 and uh, and, and see if we can beat beat, beat him. But uh, yeah, that was a, that was a lot of fun. It was a, it was awesome. a good good little you know motivation type thing. Oh my gosh, that's great. I mean that that hex bar, the Kabiki strength hex bar is really mm -hmm. so versatile. I, I love what they're doing with all their things. Um, but that's so amazing, you know. And I think for people listening, they might think, okay, well 415 that sounds a lot. I have nothing to compare it to. But what I think is even more impressive about that is the cardiovascular element that is baked into that because when you start doing high volume heavy weight it definitely it's both aerobic and anaerobic right and so to have an engine that can that can you know keep the blood going as you're doing the repetitions i mean that's just phenomenal especially at your age i mean um i might be able to get six or seven you know maybe uh with the hex bar um because i i don't do deadlifts as as heavy as i used to but um how many days a week would you say that you do the hex bar deadlift? Oh, I, I usually do it about once a week. You know, not that not that often. And, and I trade back between a hex bar and a conventional bar. I just kind of play back and forth, and mm -hmm. you know, it varies. But about once a week, I, I I try to hit deadlifts generally. You know, once a week, squats once a week. You know, some kind of pressing once a week, and then I I do a lot of sprinting and I do a lot of explosive type work, and I do some. You know, like I said, as I'm kind of transitioning into jujitsu, I'm trying to do some more jujitsu specific sort of training grip work and some of the flexibility type stuff. So that's kind of where I'm at these days. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, how many days a week would you say for people listening? And, and I encourage people to get a personal trainer, learn some moves and stuff. But how many days a week when it comes to resistance training, do you go sort of all out or hard, you know, with these different, um, you know, like before you came over, you said you did a, a walk with some heavy kettlebells, you know, and things like that, which would I would consider you know, moderate, you know, uh, low yep. or moderate, but when you're going all out, is it one or two days a week or some days you take it off or do you just go by how you feel? How does that? Yeah, a lot of it's how I feel. I mean, like, like I said, I'm trying to combine jujitsu, which, you know, the, the day after, like today I, I, I did last night and we had pretty, we went pretty hard last night. So I'm a little bit sore. So I kind of took it kind of a moderate pace thing. I usually train pretty hard and heavy the days I do jujitsu just before, mm -hmm. because I'm 
feel the most fresh in my, uh, you know, everything feels better those days. So I, you know, I, you know, when it comes to um, why are we lifting weights in the first place? I mean, I think you want to be pushing yourself close to failure yeah. at least several times a week in several sets. And so, you know, that's my goal. So anytime I'm in there uh, to do a specific workout, you know, whether it's deadlifts or squats or you know, bench press or shoulder press, I'm, I'm going close to failure. And, you know, sometimes that failure is at a lighter weight than other days, but, but I'm, I'm generally pushing to what I can do most mm-hmm. of the time I'm in there. And would you say your rep scheme, I'm sure that changes, but are you more on the six to eight reps or close to 10 plus? I, yeah, I, I don't, I certainly shy away from, I don't do a lot of single rep maxes anymore. I mean, when I competed in powerlifting, yeah, that was a goal. And, you know, when I was deadlifting, you know, close to 800 pounds, I was doing that sort of stuff. But um, these days um, I tend to uh, stay, you know, somewhere in the five to 20 rep range, somewhere in there. And I think that's, you know, if you read that, recent paper by Brad Schoenfield, Stu Phillips, and others talking about maximizing hypertrophy. Heavy, heavy weight is definitely stimulating, and you can put on muscle doing that. However, the chance for potential injury is a little bit higher. Super light weights just take a lot of time, and, and you know, it's hard to get that failure at, at a very light weight. So somewhere in that reps, rep range, 15 to 20, or 5 to 20 reps, seems to be a nice spot for that. Yeah, no, I like that. That's what I found uh, over the years is, you know, your recovery is still good. Um, periodically, I'll just do a one rep max every now and again, uh, as long as you don't have uh, injuries or limitations that, that impact that, which I think is good. Um, but getting into jujitsu, what have you noticed with that uh, in terms of your fitness? Uh, and you mentioned sort of the novelty, you're using your brain a lot more learning moves like, um, and I think that's a way to build community. Is that another aspect of jujitsu that, that attracts you to it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I've kind of over the years, I've gotten where I've been very fortunate. I've gotten, I've competed in a number of sports and I've made it to a world class level. In many cases, I've won world championships, set world records in, in a various different sports. And, you know, I, I tend to stick with the sport for about five, six, seven years. And then I kind of realize there, I can't get any better. I mean, or, or the, the amount of work it takes to make just a tiny 1% change is enormous. And so uh, then I try to sort of, do something else. And so jujitsu is brand new to me. Uh, you know, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Obviously very much a beginner. I've got a lot, you know, a lot to a lot, big hill to climb yet, but you know, from a, from a conditioning standpoint, I really haven't had any trouble, even though I'm not eating any carbohydrates, which mm-hmm. is something that a lot of people told me, you're not going to be able to roll with these guys eating carbs. And, and that's not been the case. I've been able to do that just fine. Um, I think, yeah, there is a sense of community. I think everybody's in there to get them, get them better. And even though you're trying to quote unquote, kill the guy you're rolling with by strangling him or breaking his arm. You know, that's the goal. I mean, you don't, you don't complete that, but you get them in that position where they can't, they're helpless. Um, everyone in there is very supportive and, and, you know, we're all trying to make each other better. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I haven't competed yet. You know, that'll be a different situation because in that situation you just want to win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's coming up for me for my first competition. So, but I, I've really, really, really enjoyed it. It's a lot. And the mental aspect is really interesting because you know, I'm in there trying not to be choked to death. And that's very stressful, as you might imagine, if you put yourself in that position physiologically. Not in the back of the mind, you know they're not going to actually kill you, but mm-hmm. the physiology is happening, the, the right. fight or flight reflex. And so I think that makes life in general less stressful because, you know, you, you basically, there's nothing more stressful than someone trying to kill you, right, right. no matter what happens. So beyond that, everything else is kind of minor. It's kind of like a minor thing. So it kind of makes us you know, it allows you to sort of have a better perspective in life, I think. I think that's good. And it's an outlet too, you know, probably, I mean, afterwards you probably feel, although it's, it's very stressful, very relaxed afterwards. You know? Yeah, I mean, it is. I, I, I always look forward to it. I, you know, whether win or lose, I always have a good time. I never go in there like with the with the uh, intention that I'm pissed off, I'm going to hurt somebody to, mm-hmm. to make myself better. That's never, and I don't think anybody should be doing that. But, you know, you do, I mean, you, you know I mean? You know, with exercise, and particularly when you're you're lifting something heavy or you're going to failure, you're not thinking about anything else. I mean, you're, it allows you to. It's almost like meditational, you know, where just nothing else matters except the task at hand, which is a very vital task. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, to finish off or put a put a bow on this exercise conversation, 
that to me, you know, the fact that the public health officials and, and the, the experts, so to speak, that you see on television, we've really neglected exercise and the importance and the protective effect that exercise garners. I have a paper right here. There was just a, a nice review paper. Uh, the potential physiological and cellular mechanisms of exercise to decrease the risk for severe complications and mortality following SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, again, there's been a few anecdotes of perfectly healthy people who are physically fit who get really sick. But by and large, most people, they've, they've had a resilience effect. And that's been underutilized, compounded by the fact that uh, we made people more sedentary. So um, what would you say, I mean, if, if you were in charge, you know, of public health, <laughs> uh, you know, what, what would be minimum effective dose three days a week? Yeah, I mean, I, I and again, I, I think we can't say for sure. But I mean, obviously, more than what we're doing. And I think, you know, I, I, I echo your sentiments about how poor our messaging has been about dealing with this pandemic. I mean, it's been very much one solution when this is, there are multiple, multiple, multiple factors that go into this. You know, like I said, we, we're disregarding completely the, the host factors. We know, you know, and, and it, we've known from the beginning, people that have obesity, people that have poorly controlled, controlled diabetes and, and other issues don't do well in this with this pandemic and in previous, you know, previous infectious disease, that's clearly known. And it's not surprising anyone. And maybe they, 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 their defense is, well, everybody already knows that. Why do we need to tell them? I don't think everybody understands the importance or how important that is. And if the messaging were to be, hey, just go out and go for a walk every day, you know, yeah. or do, you know, go do 20 pushups, you know, a couple times, a couple times a week, we could have, you know, certainly maybe not any, not everybody would have responded to that, but a, but a significant number of people would have responded to that, and you could have avoided, you know, more loss of life um, and morbidity by doing that. So, uh, I think you should do something every day. I mean, I, I think you know, there's. I look at it two ways. I think there is active exercise where you're trying to get stronger, faster, whatever, whatever, and then there's avoiding sedentary behavior, which is, has the opposite effect. So. Generally, if I can be, if, if, if I'm sitting, I ask myself, can I be standing? If I'm standing, can I be walking? So on and so forth. And those are the questions you should be looking at because, you know, it, it helps. It, it totally helps. I mean, if you just take, <laughs> you know, wear a continuous glucose monitor and go on a road trip, you're like, wow. And then you eat some food, your glucose levels are going to be totally exaggerated, you know? So this is, and some people never exercise at all and they're eating that junk food and then they wonder why they got super sick or, you know, this is another aspect. I mean, if people are, are really going to be diehard about immunizations as the sole solution going forward, it makes immunizations way more effective. And there's those studies, which is, is quite interesting. Um, I want to finish off with some research, uh, you know, what, what you're doing with Rivero Health. But one of the things that you mentioned on YouTube, just kind of stop talking about COVID after this. I think it's really interesting. As a surgeon, you know, because we, we heard the arguments, well, if you're not against mass or you're questioning masks, well then, so should surgeons not wear masks anymore? Mm -hmm. The primary reason that as, as a former surgeon yourself, you wore the mask was not necessarily to protect the patient from you, you know, causing their injury to have like your saliva in their injury. It was to protect stuff from splashing onto you, right? Yeah, I mean, when I wore, you know, I wore a mask for almost every day for 20 years, you know, in, in the operating room and, and sometimes outside the operating room. And uh, I never wore it with the concern that I was going to contaminate somebody with a virus in particular, you know. And the way, uh, you know, when you're in an operating room, there's a lot of times there's fluids that will fly up in your face. If you're hitting someone's knee when you're operating on someone's knee and it's bloody and you're whacking it with a hammer, blood's it fly, flies up in the air, it hits the ceiling, it hits the lights, it hits you in the face. Uh, you know, I've seen, you know, I was in, when I was in Afghanistan, I remember my, my uh, surgical partner, we were operating on this little kid with a swollen leg, which we thought was going to be an infection. Turned out it was a, a femoral artery that was, uh, that had been lacerated and was under a ton of pressure. And so when we cut through the skin, there was an, literally like an explosion of blood and it just soaked you know, the ceiling was covered red. I mean, his face was completely covered. He had to scrub out and wash his face. I, I fortunately got out of the way in time where I was standing in, in a place. But, um, you know, the, the, there, there's actually studies on operative site contamination, mask and no mask. And the studies actually show there's no real difference. You know, there's been several studies on there. So it doesn't really make a difference. Um, it really, really the main focus is probably to protect, uh, you know, the healthcare personnel, the PPE, personal protective equipment. This is one of the things that falls into that. You don't want, you know, uh, HIV positive blood, hepatitis, you know, 
uh, see positive blood splashing into your face, eyes, or mouth. Um, you don't want, uh, you know, the few cases where I had to wear like an N95, I was operating on a patient with tuberculosis. Mm. And, but other than that, we never really were concerned about respiratory viruses, bacteria, or any of that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. When you're a resident or when you're in medical school, how much time do you spend on PPE? Like on mass fitting? Is it, is it like a couple days or a week or like, you know, you know, you, you basically are shown how to like for the operating room, for instance, you learn stair cell technique and how to put your gown on and your gloves on. And that, that there was a few times too. And usually had a scrub tech, you know, t taking you through that. So until, you did it until you figured it out. So yeah. some people got it pretty quickly. Some people took three or four tries. Um, you know, there were times where we had to get fitted for masks like the N95s, you know, but that was really just a quick little, you know, this is how you wear it. This is how you do it. Any questions? No, you know, go on and, you know, you may forget some of that stuff. What, the reason why I ask is because you see these people, they put the mask in the pocket around the cell phone, then they put it on right, and then sure, take it off. Sure. It's like, do you look at that and just be like, dude, if you were to take the emotion and the politics and the fear out of it, most PPE instructors would probably say, that is probably not how you right, do it. Right, sure, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the fact that we had people wearing bandanas and socks and their girlfriend's underwear and got cut up t-shirts around their face and I mean, I just looked at that. I said, "This is ridiculous." It was yeah. completely ridiculous. Even the even the surgical masks, which I you know uh, had worn for years, I don't find much use in that, quite honestly. And I said from the beginning, if you want to protect, you know, way back in early 2020, I said, "Why don't you just take the old sick people, isolate them, give them appropriate you know actual PPA that works, and go on with life?" Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's you know how some people think the pandemic should have been handled. And some places have done that. And I think they've done just as well, if not better, than what we've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the conversation is now finally shifting. It seems that people are saying, oh, well, these these bandanas and the surgical face masks, they don't really offer the protection that we thought. And it's funny. This is one of these conspiracy theories that, that turns out to be true. Um, anyway, so let's finish off with the research. You've been, uh, you know, this carnivore diet was sort of a, I don't want to say an experimental thing, but it was, there wasn't a whole lot of people that were, were it was a more extreme version of a paleo and or keto style diet. But now there's, there's more and more people that are actually studying this, investigating this from an academic research investigative standpoint standpoint um you know high level overview any new studies that people should be aware of and findings uh yeah well, i mean there, i think there are three studies that came out in 2021 looking at the largest one was harvard's study done by david you know senior author david ludwig but belinda leonard's was the primary author that came out in december i'm trying to remember the journal it came out but it was you know it looked at 2,000 people on a carnivore diet they had people doing it from a minimum of six months all the way up to 28 years which i thought was pretty cool to have somebody in there doing it for 28 years and, I mean, the findings were basically very favorable. I mean, people lost weight. They felt better. You know, their symptoms went away. Uh, there was a, a section on diabetics, which I thought was really interesting. They had about 200 diabetics in that cohort. And 100% of them were able to come off all injectable medications outside of insulin. 94% got off all their insulin. 84% got off all their other medic all their oral medications, including metformin, which is tremendous. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a tremendous outcome. Um, there was another study out of UC Merced, and uh, I think it was also it was I think Belgium was also one of the one of the branches there, and they looked at I think 250 people doing a carnivore diet and looking at psychological motivations. Again, the, the results were very favorable. Um, Amber O'Hearn published a study on the ad nutritional adequacy of the diet and, and found it to be adequate. None of those are interventional trials, so I just have to be fair about that. These are still observational studies, so they're not you know the strength of the evidence is not tremendous but it is a starting point so if we look at the literature on a carnivore diet that's out there and there's you know there's probably 15 15 studies you know throughout the course of time every one of them shows a positive outcome and so my <clears throat> my sort of thought is if every study you have on this shows a positive outcome that should perhaps be the you know that should be be the default hypothesis until proven otherwise mm -hmm. but still there's people that say well you know we have People on a standard American diet that eat meat and they're clearly not healthy. Therefore, people eating just meat must be sick and unhealthy, which makes no sense to me. But that's that's really the, what we have. And so we're going to be doing some interventional studies on a carnivore diet through our company, Rivera, as we're, we're raising quite a bit of funding for that. So we'll do several uh, several several studies, several small studies, uh, to look at magnitude of effect on things, particularly things like autoimmune diseases. And then we'll generalize and, and, and do some larger studies, you know, after that. That's amazing. It, it seems that the, um, there's this company called Swiss Re. They were at, they're, they're a reinsurer of the insurers. So 
I didn't know this, but the insurance companies are insured by these so-called reinsurers. And because autoimmune disease, depression, heart disease, diabetes are so expensive to medically manage, it's a liability to have all these super sick patients, you know, and so forth. So the reinsurers are actually nudging the insurers to say, hey, what? Uh, hey, look, if, if we can manage this nutritionally, we would all save a lot of money. Um, so it seems that there is, there's even more push because, you know, the, the polypharmacy route is not really working. Um, have you heard more about this? This was a few years ago at uh, Low Carb Denver that one of the CEOs or, or, or some representative from Swiss Re, again, which is the reinsurer of, of like United Health and these different companies. Um, you'd think there'd be a big push at this point. Like, come on, guys, like we're underwater here. It's we're seeing some of that. Um, and, and I'm familiar with reinsurance. I'm not familiar with that particular company, but I uh, mean, you know, that, that, that is, it's very expensive to, to manage some of these diseases and getting more expensive. You know, you look at, you know, uh, some of these, like we mentioned, immune modulating drugs for, you know, the, the various autoimmune diseases, they are extremely expensive and only getting more expensive. And so uh, a lot of people, and you know, when it comes to like, if you run a big company, a significant part of your costs are employee health, you know, budgets. And so if you can, if you can cut into that significantly, there's a lot of financial incentive to do so. And so uh, I know like there's companies now that are partnering with major insurance companies that do nutrition. And, and so we're going to see a shift in that for sure. I think it's, I think our current healthcare system is clearly unsustainable from a population health standpoint, because it's failing clearly, yeah. but also from a financial standpoint. And I think we're going to see more and more alternatives. As I said, we're in the startup space. And I'm looking at the competitors out there, and there's quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. They all are vying for this this desire for a better solution, which you know most of us I like to call the the healthcare system the disease management or even the disease maintenance system because we're just maintaining people in a state of disease and throwing drugs at them, which don't really do much to uh, you know really change the course of their disease. Yeah. I think once people get to the point where they're having to take biologics and this, they finally go, look, I've done the prednisone, I've done this, and then now I have to take the, you know, then they're like, they're motivated to finally make that shift. I think if you can sort of get by with your PPI, with your antidepressant, like people are, they're not quite ready, but once they get to that extreme level, they're like, okay, I'm done with this. Plus it's, it hits them personally on the co-pays and for the, for the drugs. At least that's what I found just in my own sort of like clinical nutrition practice. But, um, so finishing off, how can people get involved in some of this research, you know, with what you guys are doing? You know, let's say someone has a friend or family member that that has ulcerative colitis or psoriasis or whatever, and they could be a great, you know, it, it, we don't want to self-select for people who are already on the diet, right? So how, how can people sort of get involved? Well, I mean, we are going to be, you know, like I said, we're, we're fundraising for this. We're opening it up. We've got some venture capital people that are interested in what we're doing. We're going to have a public arm of that so people can actually – buy a portion of the company to help invest and help us to grow and, and hopefully get a significant return on that as it does grow. So that's going on. And, and that money that's invested will, will go to doing some of this research. I'll be, you know, on social media talking about this quite a bit as we, we begin this fundraising campaign, which is going to happen probably in about, I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but about two weeks. Oh, and, cool. and so uh, that'll help. Uh, you know, you can just, uh, if you go to the site and just kind of learn and share this information, because a lot of people aren't aware of this, and a lot of people that are suffering needlessly, in my view, for decades, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, don't know this information. And this is, this is can, in many cases, it's life-altering, or in some cases, life-saving information. So go there, learn about this stuff. We've got, I mean, I, I, we've got literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of success stories categorized by just about every disease you can think of. And, and so we, we can impact a lot of things. That's awesome. That's great. And then are you taking members now to with coaching and stuff like that? I know you have your coaching call on YouTube and, and everything. Um, how does that work? Is that through Rivero as well? Yeah. So that's for, you know, like I said, I, I spend every day with rare exception, you know, I have a meeting in the morning and I, whoever wants to come in and join, we, we talk about whatever. And so like this morning we were talking to two people who have multiple sclerosis. One guy's been on carnivore and he's been killing it. I mean, his symptoms are gone. He was the you know, basically almost wheelchair bound. Now he's walking without supports. Mm. Uh, and another gal just new to it and she's kind of transitioning. So they were helping each other out. And I put in my, you know, my observations. Um, we do have, you know, something like 150 coaches that help people to transition to the diet. We have tremendous amount of resources. We have a huge research library. So we have literally thousands of studies that have been curated and, and categorized. So if you're looking on a topic and somebody says, meat is bad for the environment. We have hundreds of papers that can show you 
research paper, scientific papers show you why it may not be bad for the environment or meat is causing heart disease. We've got, you know, many, many papers showing no meat doesn't actually cause heart disease. So if you're looking for literature, uh, we have links for, you know, finding ranchers. This is a thing I'm very proud of is we, we put, you know, I think, I think food is medicine, but we need to connect the two and we need to connect the consumer and the, the person who's concerned about health with the person that's going to provide them that food. And so that's another great resource. That's awesome. Sean, one thing that I've seen uh, throughout this pandemic is the bias in the academics, you know, and there's like this sort of group think, even within academia, where it should sort of be independent and people should be focusing on science and challenging assumptions. Do you think that happens uh, when it comes to nutrition research? And it's it's literally just like, oh, this plant-based, plant-based, go vegan. Like, it seems that that could uh, like sort of you know, if you wanted to, maybe if your lab wanted to study a carnivore diet, maybe you couldn't get funding for that study. Mm -hmm. Like, is, are we seeing sort of that sort of emotional tribalism sort of shift in nutrition? Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, the, it's been exacerbated with the pandemic. You know, people are taking sides, whether it's politically motivated, you know, you're on team mask or team anti-mask or vaccine or anti, whatever it is. I mean, you, you're seeing that. But I mean, that same concern with, you know, how science is funded, how sciences perform, what are the what are the questions people want to ask? And some people don't want to ask the questions. And, you know, they're not asking all the questions. And so if the question doesn't get asked, you never know the answer to that. And so like you pointed out, is it hard to get a study on meat funded? It's very hard. Uh, you know, I've been trying for a couple of years and, you know, we've been we've been trying to do this stuff. And even when I talked to the National uh, Cattlemen's Beef Association, which has all the money, they were not interested particularly mm -hmm. in studying and studying on this. So I was like, this is challenging. Um so yes, there is there is a significant conflict of interest. Um, we know that you know most of the funding is done through industry, and industry generally funds studies that are favorable to them. Um, not all the time, but most of the time, I think the studies on that show like something like eighty five percent of studies funded by industry are favorable to industries, and the ones that aren't don't get refunded. Those authors don't get refunded again. And so, uh, sure, we have that. We have this. Uh, strong bias and conflict of interest in the nutrition researchers, which has been there for literally decades now. And it's tough to crack that nut. You know, there's people that are just absolutely convinced that bread meat is going to kill me, mm -hmm. even though the, I mean, if you think about the number of people that have been killed by red meat through the, through the course of time of humanity versus the number of people have probably died from lack of enough meat, it's probably skewed very heavily towards the latter. Oh, yeah. I mean, Skittles and Pop-Tarts and bread and, and yeah. all the other stuff, right? Um, there's a study that comes to mind, and I haven't read uh, the materials and methods in great detail, but it was looking at healthcare professionals that had went on a vegan diet versus a, a low-carb keto diet and their outcomes with COVID, and it leaned in favor of the plant-based diet. Uh, there was a Mick the Vegan, he's a YouTuber, and he, he kind of did a critical review of me because I was suggesting the, the keto diet because it down-regulates this inflammatory sensor, the NLRP3 inflammasome. And he criticized me and said, hey, there's this the study, and I, I have it, a PDF, I need to read it. Have you bumped into that? And if so, what were the... I, I remember seeing the study. I don't think I looked into it in great detail. I don't know if they were comparing it to a keto diet. I thought it was just vegan versus just a standard diet, but maybe, maybe it was. I don't know. Uh, and then again, I... I think you just look at, for one, you look at a healthy user bias. I mean, that's the first thing. And it wasn't very well controlled. It wasn't obviously a controlled study mm. or very well controlled study. And so I would say, again, if you take people that are very concerned about their health and they're eating, you know, it's it's always a marker. It's a proxy marker for affluence and, you know, healthfulness in general, you know, when, when you want to go and I eat. And, and, and I, I don't think they were vegan diets anyway. I think it was more, yeah. they ate a higher percentage of fruits and vegetables. And it's like, you know, the same thing I see with like, guys like Tom Brady, they'll say, well, Tom Brady, you know, he's 20, 80, he's 80% 80 plant and 20% meat. But if you look at the amount of meat he eats compared to the standard American diet, he's eating twice as much meat as the average American. Mm -hmm. So you're like, well, is that the reason? Or because he, he's eating more meat than everybody else and he's not eating junk food. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the uh, the difference there, quite honestly. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'll dive into it and I'll, we'll maybe talk about it later, but kind of interesting, you know, um, that that at least people are starting to talk about this, but you're right. It's like, you know, if you're not eating uh, animal products, eggs, you know, butter, meat, things like that, then it's like, well, what else are you adding in, in your diet? And that could be having a negative effect. But um, Sean, thanks as always for coming on and sharing just really great information over the past two years. It's been interesting to see um, who is courageous enough to uh, question what we're, what we're being told. 
in fact, the media, there was just a, an article, the Denmark press was, was, was being self-criticism, self-critical of their own lack of questioning what the government was telling them. So I, I feel like we finally hit this point where, you know, the, the direction of the pandemic hasn't really uh, panned out to what everyone thought it, how it would occur. Uh, cases are at record levels, hospitalizations are filled, and people are saying, well, maybe we should have been a little bit more critical of what we were being told about uh, you know, how to pursue this. But that being said, I'm just grateful. Uh, I always look forward to your videos. So I want all of our listeners to check you out on Instagram, on YouTube, uh, and then Rivero Health. They can just go there, RiveroHealth.com? It's just Rivero.com. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so my Instagram, Sean Baker, 1967. My YouTube is Sean Baker, MD. So. Nice. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on. And thanks, thanks to all of you for listening all the way through. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment below and hit that like button. That goes a long way. And we'll catch you on a future episode down the road.